John. John Schauf is the CTO of the National Energy Research Supercomputing Center. Is also the department head for computer science and data science and at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He has been the co-author of many publications in the area of parallel computing, in the area of supercomputing. And he has been very generous to HRR to give us advice and counsel. And today he has agreed to come and give us a plenary talk today. So John, take it away. All right, so we'll talk about reimagining co-design for HPC systems and uh, data centers uh, for our heterogeneous future. And this is an oft uh, seen uh, talk. Oh, I wanted to comment too, the last time that um, uh, Subashish and I addressed this audience, it was for the third HIR. And it's just really amazing how far this has come since then. And, and I'm, you know, it's just uh, fantastic to, to be able to participate in, in, in this symposium. So we've shown this plenty of times before. This is what we used to explain the Exascale program, which was that uh, Denard scaling ended in 2004. And so we weren't able to extract uh, uh, efficiently more performance from individual cores. So we have this exponential growth in cores, but now as we approach the uh, Exascale program, so this is what we used to explain the need for a multi-billion dollar Exascale uh, computing program for uh, high performance computing. Um, exascale is going to happen right about when things are really starting to taper off in terms of the uh, scaling challenges as Subashish uh, described. And, and so it looks like we're going to scoot just under the, uh, under the door uh, for this, but the question that I'm asking now is, and then what? Because uh, I spent, you know, 10 years uh, building up to selling the uh, Exascale program, and we already were in the middle of the program, and we need to think about what we do next. And what we do next is really going to be contemplating a heterogeneous um, future. Uh, so this is from Hennessy and Patterson's Turing Award talk. Um, this isn't just uh, an illusion. We are seeing a tapering off of measured performance for applications uh, or workloads that are important to us. Uh, and this is going to be problematic for the, our suppliers too, because if systems are tapering off in terms of the performance improvement, then that means we're going to dilate, uh, uh, spread out our procurement cycles. And so we'll be purchasing machines less frequently. And so this is bad news unless we can identify new approaches that enable us to continue performance scaling at historical rates. Uh, so this is for them, not just for us. Um, and, you know, we already see in other parts of the industry, for example, uh, cell phone manufacturers are co-integrating many different discrete heterogeneous accelerators and also integrating these things together with advanced packaging technologies, as uh, Bill uh, Chen described in uh, his opening talk. Uh, we're also seeing in the meg mega data centers, we had first the Google TPU, there's many, many different kinds of AI accelerators, and they have uh, a lot of their secret sauce is uh, not just in new architectures, uh, but also um, uh, integration techniques like the Cerebrus wafer scale integration. Uh, uh, and this is a, a trend across the data center. So it's not just the stuff that fits in your hand, it's also for server class technologies. Overall, we see this trend towards extreme heterogeneity. And the question for HPC and also future data centers is how can we maximally exploit this for scalable systems? I wanted to point out that, you know, uh, this move towards heterogeneous integration and specialization and uh, is, is not uh, simply some computer architect or, or packaging, you know, uh, person's dream. This is really how nature uh, extracts more performance when encountering a resource limited environment. So if we think of like the you know, olden days of, you know, computing, or now olden, 19, yeah, 2010, uh, we used to uh, have powerful general purpose processors uh, like the Xeon and the IBM power processor. 
Uh, but when faced with a uh, post Denard scarce, you know, food scarce environment, uh, these these kind of powerful raptors give way to, you know, uh, uh, large numbers of you know really aggressive sparrows, and so that would be the Intel Knights Landing or the AMD uh, processors, Cavium, Marvel, and really to some extent GPUs, all kind of the same processor core element, but, uh, but much lighter weight and many, many more of them. Um, but if you uh, go further and, and fast forward, uh, once you go to post more, you know, scarcity or really where the transistor shrinking is not driving the technology uh, ecosystem, then you start to see many specialized uh, systems. And this is kind of like the, these are the, uh, uh, Darwin's uh, bird beaks here. And this is where Apple and Google and Amazon and other companies like Samba Nova uh, and such are going. And so, you know, this is a, a colleague of mine, uh, Neil Thompson, uh, one of the only people I know who has uh, dual degrees in um, uh, economics and also computer architecture. Uh, and, and they're basically pointing out that the economic model that we had in the past was totally focused on shrinking that transistor. Uh, you know, shrinking the transistor gave us better cost performance, which led to market growth, which read, led to reinvestment, which led to more transistor scaling, and so on and so forth. That was our virtual, virtuous cycle. And that cycle is, is starting to slow down. Uh, the the uh, costs, uh, the ability to scale the transistors is making this a less profitable market. And that, so that was driven by the bottom of the stack. Uh, the systems focus is where heterogeneous integration comes in. And this is where we're betting our future is really that uh, increased function, you know, with heterogeneous integration, we can get increased functionality uh, and potentially lower cost, which leads to market growth, which leads to investment, which again leads to device circuit uh, system advances in system integration. And so this is the systems focus, and this is more innovation at the top, um, uh, where we have to have a, a co-design of software algorithms and hardware architectures uh, comes into being. So it isn't just a technology roadmap. It is also the uh, co-design, which involves also the software and the algorithms that map onto that because uh, uh, benefits are being delivered at the system level. And, and it was relatively invisible when we were shrinking transistors. Um, I'll point you, to, there's some other great papers on Neil's uh, webpage that I point you to, but uh, you definitely seeing e economics, uh, the economic uh, basis for this, in addition to the technological basis, is really great to see together. All right, so for science, we're really talk, looking at architecture specializations that are targeted at science applications. So I'll talk some about, you know, for example, in material science, uh, density functional theory, uh, creating uh, machines that are either CGRAs or ASICs or heterogeneously integrated specialized components to serve material science. Uh, we're also looking at cryo electro uh, electron microscopy, uh, genomics applications, which are one of the fastest growing parts of our workload, and also our co traditional computational fluid dynamics. Um, uh, you know, concept of uh, three, 3D integration could lead to a, uh, you know, uh, uh, making the chip match more or less the shape of the problem, which is 3D uh, uh, block structured uh, grids. And uh, this, all of this needs to be done, though, in close collaboration with applied mathematics. So this you know, in the past, as a computer architect, you think in terms of how do I make deeper pipelines? How do I uh, add more fault resilience? All things that are completely invisible to the uh, to the user, but also um, uh, divorced from the application that was actually is that is actually running in the machine. Completely orthogonal to the app application, in a sense. Uh, you, you need to be good at designing better pipelines and functional units. You don't have, didn't have to understand what the algorithmic target was because uh, we thought of a universal machine, uh, uh, the uh, general purpose computing. 
if we're thinking in terms of specialization, then you can't specialize without understanding the target that you're specializing to. Uh, and, and this is what's going to be fundamentally different uh, about moving into this new heterogeneous and specialized future is um, you, you have to design hardware with an understanding of the algorithm, the uh, mathematical target and the algorithmic alternatives to achieve your, your goal for the target application. Uh, and, and you really can't design effective hardware without taking, bringing the applied math into the design loop. And, and that's, that's, that's going to be a big deal. So in terms of what we're looking at, uh, in terms of potential path, paths forward for HPC, we're looking at uh, specialization where we have, um, you know, use these uh, uh, heterogeneously integrated elements to create purpose-built machines for big science targets. Uh, and so this would be kind of like the strategy Google has with the TPU, uh, but, but for applied for science rather than in their case, it was a uh, AI inference problem. The other is um, co-integration of many heterogeneous accelerators to target multiple workloads. So uh, this is more of a dark silicon approach. So it's special purpose, general purpose, um, more or less like the uh, Apple, you know, smartphone and Samsung smartphone chips. And then the last one uh, is photonic uh, disaggregation. So disaggregation, uh, you know, we, we, we've looked at um, uh, two and a half D integration. Uh, Subhashish also talked about bring, uh, combining together 3D stacks with two and a half D uh, uh, co-packaging. Uh, disaggregation enables us to use uh, co-packaging in order to break out of the package. And now we don't, aren't even just limited by 3D. Uh, you can go multidimensional if you, uh, with, with, once you break outside of the package. Um, and, and here's a more visual view of these. So uh, purpose-built machines, specialization, heterogeneous integration. I'll talk some about Project 38 and, uh, and resource disaggregation with photonic MCMs. All right, so uh, we'll start with specialization. Um, and I'll tell you the story of our uh, uh, algorithm design for uh, programmable hardware accelerators. And in this case, we're talking about a accelerator for a material science application. Uh, this is a pie chart here. Uh, NERSC is the National Energy Research Supercomputer Center. Um, uh, it uh, serves all of the Office of Sciences uh, HPC needs, so it has 11,000 users, 700 or more applications, and despite the diversity of users and applications, uh, nearly a quarter of the all CPU cycles in the entire DOE uh, goes to this one particular algorithm, density functional theory, which is uh, uh, first principles calculations of the electronic structure of uh, atoms or, or really materials. Uh, and so you can use this uh, to simulate and predict the behavior of a bulk material based on uh, first principles com computation of the electron cloud around those materials. So given this is such a huge science target, we, we know that uh, with uh, generating custom hardware for uh, some core elements of that algorithm, we can get 50 to 100x improvement even over uh, the latest GPUs. Um, uh, you know, we basically wanted to see how far we could push things if we target uh, this, uh, this particular uh, class of algorithms. Uh, so this is kind of a diagram of the, uh, the core uh, uh, density functional theory kernel. It has a very tight loop here in the middle, which is comprised of uh, 3D parallel FFTs, um, a, a whole bunch of them done on uh, 128 cubed blocks of memory, uh, 64, uh, 64 to 128 cubed uh, blocks. So many of those streaming through. And then you have this uh, TSQR uh, Cholesky, it's really uh, order n cubed compute bound matrix matrix multiply. Uh, and, and so this is extremely compute intensive. 
Um, and in terms of memory, we looked at a uh, LS3DF, which is a communication avoiding uh, formulation of the density functional theory algorithm. And the interesting thing about LS3DF is that it reformulates the algorithm such that very little communication is required between accelerators. Uh, in that way, you aren't limited by data movement, but it, uh, it isolates the computation inside of that patch. And we also think that we can reduce the problem footprint per chip so that it fits entirely within SRAM, which could potentially be stacked on top of the uh, die, uh, or even uh, for reticle limited package, you could put it uh, uh, next uh, um, in, inside of the uh, uh, package. Uh, regardless, we're looking at taking a creating a custom compute engine for the core of that uh, loop. And, uh, and if you want to scale up the size of problem you want to uh, target, you just add more of these custom compute engines. Uh, and, and one of the key observations in doing this custom acceleration is that when we were, uh, you know, all of our algorithms to date are formulated for von Neumann CPU type formulation, but also even GPUs, they have this notion of an instruction processor, where I fetch and execute one instruction followed by another followed by another, even if they're parallel, it's kind of a bulk synchronous type parallel. So imp implicitly you as a programmer write your algorithm with this instruction processor formulation in mind. But when you want to do a custom circuit, a custom accelerator for this kind of thing, uh, you, you end up with a data flow type approach where really the operators are stamped down onto the specialized uh, architecture and you need to flow data through those operators. Uh, and so it's a very different way of formulating the algorithm. Uh, and, and this requires uh, a lot of reth rethink of the applied mathematics in order to fit into this kind of data flow form. Uh, and, and again, most scientific computing is done with these uh, vendor tuned libraries. So I invoke the uh, FFTW library followed by a vendor tuned VLAS followed by maybe a, a, a user tuned kernel. And so we have this sequential formulation with subroutine calls to invoke each of those things. That's kind of baked into the way that we design our codes. But if we want to actually maximally utilize heterogeneously integrated uh, specialized components, you want to get all those components lit up at the same time uh, if you want to get the maximum performance. Of course, for energy efficiency, we can just light them up one at a time and do the dark silicon thing. But if we want the highest possible performance, then we need to formulate it for this data flow through those components. And uh, Torsten Hofler at ETH Switzerland has also been thinking these same thoughts for FPGAs, but it, it applies also for heterogeneously integrated um, uh, IP blocks as well. Um, so, you know, we've been collaborating with a uh, CGRA company that I'll leave them anonymous for the moment, but uh, going from a uh, hand tuned code running on a state of the art uh, GPU. Uh, to reformulating the algorithm as data flow and then uh, uh, creating a circuit design for all practical purposes. So we could have targeted an ASIC um, with, with this uh, and, and created synthesizable RTL, but we actually discovered with uh, one of these AI startups that's uh, doing a data flow type of a, uh, uh, design uh, that, that simply reformulating from cut, hand tuned and vendor tuned code to uh, really not entirely fully optimal um, uh, data flow code, we're able to achieve a 60x speed up over the current uh, state of the art Intel uh, based supercomputer. Um, and then we also were able to demonstrate a 20x speed up over a state of the art GPU. And, and this is using a CGRA. Uh, if we wanted to go with uh, heterogeneously integrated chiplets that had the elements of this algorithm. Imagine if each of these little boxes here were chiplets. Um, we could create a, uh, uh, we could probably achieve much higher speed ups even than that, uh, but, but of course at a higher cost. But this is, this is, you know, um, uh, this is very, sh shows a lot of promise as a way for us to extract more performance from uh, supercomputers. Uh, but what we really need, uh, you know, the efforts to date for doing this kind of uh, targeted custom machine are very artisanal and not very scalable. If you look at the 
uh, list of co-authors for the Google TPU. It's a very, very long list of co-authors in that paper. Uh, same with the Anton system. The question is, how can we create a uh, co-design environment that also brings the applied mathematician also into the design loop and accelerates our ability to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to create these kind of custom machines. Uh, we also need to have a systematic uh, mathematical approach to uh, transform these kind of sequential to pipeline or other kinds of layouts uh, uh, with these heterogeneous integrated architectures. And in the long run, accelerate the design of accelerators with uh, some kind of a uh, intermediate representation that spans hardware and software and had a lot of great conversations with Paul friends on about that uh, years ago and now we're starting to see some hardware intermediate representations that 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 really actually do this uh, but um, uh, but yeah this is this is where it's going so next up I'm going to talk some about um, project 38 uh, so this is, um, but we'll dive into it. So this is a heter another uh, uh, angle on heterogeneous integration. And that's the key thing to understand here is that there isn't just one way to do heterogeneous integration. Uh, there are multiple paths forward in this and all of them are covered in the HIR uh, document, which is why it's so impressive. So looking at another angle on heterogeneous integration, uh, Project 38 is a, a cross-agency architectural exploration. It involves three agencies, uh, sort of. Uh, it's the DOD plus the Office of Science side of the uh, DOE, and then the NNSA part of DOE. So that's the three in Project 38. Now, Dave Mountain tells me that it gets its name from uh, there are three agencies and there are eight ways to nirvana and you have to pick the middle path. And uh, you can ask Dave uh, Mountain uh, more about that, how he came up with that name. But uh, the near term goal is to identify and quantify the performance and value of uh, specific architectural concepts and integration approaches that would, uh, uh, and they should be demonstrated against a limited set of apps of interest to in DOE and DoD. But uh, the long-term goal is to create a uh, enduring capability to explore uh, architectural innovations together, but also to be able to drive the development of uh, purpose-built or specialized um, uh, architectures for the, for the future. And you can go to NIDRD. In fact, if you do a search for Google search for NIDRD and Project 38, this will be the first thing that comes up. Uh, and this is a description of our phase one explorations. Um, but I will touch on that briefly here. Uh, some of the phase one studies that, um, uh, that, that, that we had were uh, looking at um, uh, using these super lightweight message cues as a way to communicate between these heterogeneously integrated elements for a specialized machine that's built of uh, fixed purpose uh, building blocks. Uh, and we showed that we could get uh, 8x improved scaling and performance over the conventional coherence mechanisms that we typically use for co-integrating things. Uh, we have a recoding engine for um, doing uh, efficient compression, decompression of our data structures, but other fi uh, fine-grained finite state machines like pattern matching engines. Um, we looked at uh, fixed function accelerators. This is an example with an FFT. Uh, you know, we could basically match the performance of a top shelf uh, Intel chip, the max performance we could get from a night's landing, uh, and it would use only 4.5 square millimeters of chip area in 14 nanometer technology, running at only one gigahertz, and that would just max out the off chip memory bandwidth. So if, if an FFT, which is a big deal for us, uh, if, if maxing out the, uh, if we can use four and a half millimeters to match the performance of a chip design server class chip that takes 450 square millimeters of area, then I have a lot of room on that chip to do lots of different uh, compute intensive uh, accelerators and co-integrate them uh, uh, together in, in a package. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's competitive against using the general purpose hardware to do the same thing. <coughs> and <coughs> last is uh, gather scatter uh, using uh, uh, word granularity memory elements. 
So, you know, just looking quickly at the fixed function accelerators design uh, study, you know, this is kind of adopting the smartphone SOC strategy with uh, the mixed uh, mix of fixed function accelerators. But a lot of the accelerators that they see in the die photo here of uh, Apple A8 uh, chip are focused on, you know, um, uh, echo cancellation, audio and video processing. You know, we want to target the commonly used scientific primitives. So if we were to redo this chip and have it focused on science, then you'd have a chiplet for uh, that accelerates the BLAS operations and another chiplet or functional uh, IP block that uh, that covers uh, the wide variety of FFTs uh, that, that we have. And uh, so that, that would be a basis for spinning, uh, using the same concept that Apple and Samsung are using for their smartphone chips, but applying heterogeneous integration for HPC type hardware. Um, and this gets us back to the whole control uh, instruction processor versus data flow thing. Uh, right now, when we think about um, uh, abstraction for programming systems, we think in terms of subroutine calls, which is uh, arguably, at least Steve McConnell claimed that it was the subroutine is arguably the single greatest invention in, in computer science because it enables us to get uh, abstraction, uh, hierarchical abstraction. And the question is, when we move to this kind of data flow type environment, how, you know, this, this invoking one subroutine call after another is sequential. It's totally instruction processor. As we move to heterogeneous integration, we need to think of new programming abstractions that enable us to encapsulate these kind of uh, data uh, type transposed uh, programming environments. And it's, it's not clear, you know, with all of our computer languages right now are really oriented towards instruction processors. I think there's going to be some big changes in terms of our programming systems in order to meet uh, uh, these, um, uh, this, this heterogeneous future. Uh, second is the, you know, what abstractions should we have for intercomponent communication for heterogeneously integrated subsystems? I mean, we've traditionally uh, migrated any specializations like memory management units or floating point units have always moved closer and closer to the core until they become an ISA extension. But if we want to talk about modularity at the package level or at the system level, then, you know, the traditional way is to use hardware coherent memory mapped. Uh, but this is fundamentally unscalable. So we need to look at things like software coherency, like PGAS or global namespace, uh, and, and possibly message queues or FIFOs, uh, hardware message queues or FIFOs of some sort in order to um, effectively and efficiently um, uh, co-integrate multi-vendor IP potentially. Um, because, uh, you know, uh, using cache coherence, now suddenly you're thrust into the middle of a highly tightly wound proprietary environment. Uh, so how can we make this so that multiple providers can work productively together uh, for, uh, to create co-packaged uh, integrated systems? Uh, you know, there's uh, CXL has been touted as a potential fabric. Uh, but it's it's really kind of uh, uh, CXL is built on top of the um, uh, PCIe uh, V6 V5 and V6 um, uh, uh, physical layer, and it fixes some of the strangeness in terms of um, transaction ordering semantics, so that it could be used as a memory fabric of sorts. Um, and I think this is great for disaggregation and uh, 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 being able to have a multi accelerator environment inside of a, a node uh, or super node type package but for something inside of the package where we have these little chiplets and stuff, it, it seems kind of heavyweight. And so, you know, something that we should think about is going beyond just the physical packaging techniques is, is there an opportunity for standards that would enable a multi-vendor environment when we move towards heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneously integrated systems in the future? Uh, you know, I'm betting on a global namespace abstraction because there's a lot of work that shows that you can use that also for your security and trusted ex packaging of your security and trusted execution environment for a mixed uh, mixed vendor uh, IP environment so you can get security in addition to the modularity. But uh, this is something that should be thought about for the next 
iteration of the heterogeneous integration roadmap. All right, this is be the last section here, and then I'll uh, close down for questions because we only have about 10 minutes uh, left, including the Q&A. So this is a resource disaggregation, and this is a fairly quick section. Uh, I think that uh, you'll hear more from Gordon uh, Keeler uh, and has a very exciting uh, DARPA pipes program, which delivers the fundamental technologies, I think, that will enable this. All right, so inside of the modern data center, we have very diverse node configurations to serve different data center workloads. So for example, if I am doing training in a data center, then if I wanna scale that up, I, I, you have these things like the, the NVIDIA DGX, where you have a whole bunch of GPUs that have really fat NVLink connections between those GPUs so that to scale training, each GPU trains separately, and then it has to exchange information about the weights so that to keep the uh, trained uh, weights consistent with one another, and then it does the next batch of training, so on and so forth. A lot of bandwidth going between the GPUs. But when I want to switch to do inference, the GPUs don't need to speak to each other at all. I want to take all of that bandwidth and I want to connect it to the top of rack switch and stream as much data through that GPU as I possibly can. Uh, and so the training node is exactly the opposite of what I need for the inference node and vice versa. Uh, and, and as a result, they end up with two different racks of systems or two different systems really uh, to serve these two different workloads. And so you end up with marooned resources, which is that I've run out of um, uh, nodes in my training rack and my inference rack is underutilized or vice versa. Uh, that's called marooned resources and that keeps data center utilization to you know, 30% or below um, is because of that. Uh, the next up is for data mining. I might want to connect all of my uh, links to the NVRAM, the, the, the storage system. And if I want to do graph analytics, I actually want to connect a lot of resources to high bandwidth memories and inter uh, system scale connectivity. Uh, so this constitutes four different system designs with modern technology, but uh, oh, and, and the, the next thing is uh, memory disaggregation. Memory has now become one of the most expensive parts of our systems. And uh, certainly we buy all of our nodes with 128 gigs of memory because at least 15% of our workload needs all of that 128 gigs of memory. But 75% of the workload uses less than 25% of the memory. There's got to be some way that we could, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul, you know, steal memory from the nodes that don't need as much memory and donate it to the ones that do need that extra memory. Because um, otherwise, you know, 75% of our memory at any given time is just burning power and capital cost and not doing anything useful. So disaggregated node architecture, this is kind of the scenario here is that, you know, our current server designs, we pack everything that we think that we might need into each node of our system, and then we replicate, and that's how we build up our system, even though any given workload might only need a fraction of those resources that I co-integrated into that node. In a disaggregated rack, you kind of uh, pool those resources, and then you use some kind of fabric technology in order to custom wire up uh, custom nodes for each of your applications. And, and there are deployed uh, disaggregation solutions actually operating now in data centers like Google and Facebook, but the current uh, fabric technology they're using operates at one to 10 gigabytes per second. Uh, and this is significantly inferior to DRAM bandwidth, which ranges from 100 gigabytes per second to a terabyte per second per chip. So how can we do better in, uh, in terms of disaggregation technologies? Uh, and so the exciting thing that's happening, you know, in packaging technology here is um, uh, 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 this, this wasn't really true, you know, silicon photonics has always been trying to break into the uh, data centers environment, but the focus has been really high series type channels, uh, specifically because uh, there's a limited number of pins that you can cram underneath of a, a conventional chip. Uh, the pitch, pin pitch and the, the growth rate of pins on a, a modern CP package is, is fairly slow and much lower than um, uh, Moore's law growth rates. The, the big ex, you know, development in packaging, of course, uh, is with co-packaged memory, for example, it isn't that they're going at higher bandwidths. The, the higher bandwidth is achieved by having higher packaging density. 
uh, so solder micro bumps and emerging copper pillar technology. So we're improving overall throughput by improving packaging density uh, and not as much putting pressure on the CERTES. And this is just an amazing confluence with the, the sweet spot for silicon photonics is also not high CERTES, but actually lots of different colors of light in each, each ring operating at a fairly low data rate is, is really the, this wide and slow is the most efficient, energy efficient way to operate silicon photonics. And now more, even more recently, the emergence of cone laser sources. So if even with these first two things, even if they worked brilliantly, if I had to have a separate indium phosphide or tunable laser source for each frequency of light, we're still dead in the water. So the emergence of efficient cone laser sources that can generate hundreds of frequencies uh, using a single um, uh, packaging element, uh, this this is a, just a magic alignment of the stars here, and this really enables us to overcome uh, the challenge of breaking out of that package. So instead of having like a high bandwidth memory co-packaged with your GPU or CPU, you could actually have these silicon photonic uh, modules uh, co-packaged, and now suddenly I'm not limited by that two centimeters or, uh, of reach uh, for an electrical connection, I can go anywhere in the system. Uh, and if I can break out of the package and go anywhere in the system, I could use a, a, a optical circuit switch in order to uh, connect between diverse optical MCMs and create, wire up any custom system that I need. Uh, in fact, uh, so that this thing with these, these, instead of having four different systems in the top, we could have actually one set of pooled resources and use the OCS, uh, even low radix and very slow reconfiguration times OCSs to optical circuit switches to configure diverse, heterogeneous, uh, custom tailored systems for each of the pieces of the workload. Uh, and, and this gets us to the anatomy of a value metric. Uh, we've been focused in silicon photonics of, uh, you know, it's good stuff over bad stuff. The good stuff's performance, bad stuff's a measured watt or cost, other things. And in the past in photonics, we focused on the measured watt part and saying that we're going to reduce the number of picojoules per bit for the link technology. And this is all very important, but only 30% of the data center power goes to the network. Um, and so that means an infinitely efficient, you know, link technology would get us 30%. With the thinking at a systems level and thinking uh, uh, in, in using disaggregation and bandwidth steering, and by delivering bandwidth to where it's needed, by taking it from where it's not, we can deliver on the numerator of this metric and deliver on performance. And there's a whole much, lot more headroom 30% on the numerator of this value metric than the denominator. So these two things together is going to be the uh, power play, I think, for photonics uh, in the future. And this, by the way, breaks us out. It's not just uh, 2D or 3D. This breaks us out of the, our, uh, even the 3D thing. This enables us, the photonics enables us to go multidimensional in terms of our integration. Uh, so uh, this, by the way, is a big project led by Karen Bergman and NVIDIA and Cisco and Microsoft Research are all involved, uh, but this very exciting RPE enlightened uh, project. So I wanted to acknowledge the, the large team here. So that gets us to the end here. So the final thoughts here, and you'll see this also in Neil Thompson stuff, uh, the area, the era of the universal computer uh, was a correct answer to deliver value for our scientific customers in the past. But in this new era, that's not a viable approach. It doesn't deliver uh, value to our customers. Um, uh, we need to figure out how to ride the uh, heterogeneous integration uh, future and we need to find the right economic model for uh, that's based on the system focus rather than a transistor focus in the long term. And that's all I've got. So questions. Hi, John. Th Thanks. Thank you. This is an excellent uh, presentation. I missed a little bit. Maybe you talked about it and I missed it. Did, sure. Can you comment on latency and how important latency is in optimizing oh, yeah. an entire system architecture? 
Yes, no, latency is definitely uh, a big concern. Um, and uh, for, for this, uh, if you look here with the use of the optical circuit switches, the, uh, we, we looked at uh, ways that we could implement it using direct links uh, so that you don't go through buffered, uh, uh, we don't go through, through OEO conversions, optical electrical optical conversions, and there's no buffering. Um, so in terms of DRAM latencies, uh, so it's really, uh, CPUs and GPUs are very uh, sensitive to latency um, uh, in the DRAM, less so for the storage technology. We've been, we've already are disaggregating storage technology. We've disaggregated storage for years because it's very high latency. In terms of memory latency, uh, high bandwidth memory latencies are in the order of 140 nanoseconds and conventional DRAM can get you just under, you know, uh, 90 or 60 to 90 nanoseconds. Um, in terms of CERTES, the CERTES latencies are about the same whether you're going electrical or optical. So there's not much difference there. In terms of propagation latency, it's about five nanoseconds per meter. So as long as we stay within the rack, then uh, the latency incurred by uh, this approach is still small compared to the actual latency of the DRAMs. And lastly, uh, if you put forward error correction in, if you do uh, FEC light, which is what they're talking about for CXL, that's about two nanoseconds plus the time it takes to clock in the symbols uh, that you're correcting against. So that's about uh, at 100 gigabit per second link, that's about uh, uh, 20 nanoseconds. And if you go to a 200 gigabit per second link, that goes down to about 10 nanoseconds in total for forward error correction plus uh, the, the clocking the symbols in. So the answer is yes, latency is hugely important. That's why you want direct link, uh, uh, optical links, and uh, but those within a rack or a, a super node, it's still reasonable. Thank you. Yep. And we have a question from Chris Bailey, and that'll be our last question so that okay. we make sure to move on to Gordon Keeler's talk on time. Okay. Um, Chris, do you want to say that out loud or? Great. Yes, uh, no, I'd be delighted to. Thank you, John. It's a very interesting talk. I was quite uh, interested in this code design, um, yeah. uh, particularly software algorithms mm -hmm. yeah. and the and the architecture um, and the influence of applied maths and the algorithms on this on heterogeneous integration. That whole concept, very interesting. Uh, but I guess the question that came to my mind first is: you know, we've got many CEA tools out there. Uh, they've been developed over years and years. Some of them started with Fortran, mm -hmm. many of them still using Fortran, C, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, moving to CUDA now for, say, GPUs. But uh, my question is, is, what's the current status and challenges for sort of partitioning these mm -hmm. codes across uh, and doing load balancing and that sort of yeah. thing to optimize? And I'm thinking, you know, I could have a billion cell multi-physics calculation here. And I think what you're saying is that calculation or that architecture or that those solvers should influence the architecture of a heterogeneous integ uh, integrated system. Well, it, it, it in fact goes both ways. I'll give you a specific example. So um, radiation transport uh, is important for a number of DOE codes for reasons that I shouldn't have to explain, but uh, uh, there, the traditional way of doing radiation transport was to do um, Monte Carlo methods, uh, but that became too slow. The, the alternative approach to doing radiation transport is ray tracing. Um, if you look at GPU hardware, uh, you, they, uh, the traditional GPUs are really good for Monte Carlo, but they also now have photorealistic ray tracing GPUs. They're completely different hardware architecture design. Hardware software co-design is saying that uh, I will look at uh, the influence of the hardware on my algorithm choice, but vice versa, I'll look at the influence of the algorithm. Uh, the, uh, the, the algorithm will look at the, uh, it, it goes both ways, basically is what it comes yeah. to. It's, it's the combination of the hardware and the software and co-design is you look at the areas of flexibility in the algorithm and use the constraints of the hardware to drive changes in the algorithm, vice versa, you look at areas where the algorithm is inflexible and use that to try to drive changes in the hardware and you iterate on that. Um, 
going to the programming systems, your question about Fortran is that I, I'd say I started uh, in supercomputing when we were going from uh, vector machines to parallel machines. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that era of uncertainty, we designed codes to be future-proof, uh, made them extremely flexible and able to port against heterogeneous, very different hardware. Uh, we've gotten lazy over the past 30 years and our cards are, codes now are very inflexible and, and so is our tool chains. Uh, we are going to enter an era now where DOE is investing heavily in trying to create uh, compiler technologies that uh, enable us to do semantic lifting and uh, go to a future where we can uh, understand our code, or at least the programming systems understand our code at a higher level of semantics so we can retarget more easily, but we're not there yet. We've gotten lazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, want, I think what you're saying is we don't need to rewrite all those legacy codes to fit certain hardware. Um, yeah, well, we, 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 we've done it before. So that's why I have confidence that we can re rediscover uh, how to write code that is more flexible. Um, we just haven't had to do it for the past 30 years. Uh, mm -hmm. It's MPI plus Fortran is good enough. Yeah. Uh, but if you look at the um, Argonne and DOE had a workshop, uh, Justin Gottschlick at uh, Intel, you should look at his papers. And also Al Alvin uh, Chen, uh, his Metalift framework, which it reads the code and then it doesn't just parse it and say, this is what instructions I should admit. It parses the code and says, this is what this piece of code is actually doing at a mm -hmm. semantic level. And once you lift it up to the semantic level, there's a lot of amazing things that can be done uh, in terms of making your code migratable to very, very uh, different architectures and make it more future.